Well, hello and welcome to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Sam Hales. This show is brought to you in association with the magazine that I edit. That's Premier Christianity magazine. And my guest on the show today is Pete Hughes. Pete is the pastor of KXC Church. That's in Kings Cross, central London. He's also the author of a new book called All Things New, published by David C. Cook and Out Now. And I have to say right from the outset, Pete, I adored this book. Uh, I gave it a five out of five on the latest issue of the mag. So thank you so much for writing it. And thank you so much for coming on the show pleasure thank you thank you for your review and thank you for having me it's great to be here so we've got to start of course with the big subject of the day which is still the coronavirus lockdown we're recording this when lockdown is starting to be eased so we're recording this actually on the day that the shops started to open again but how has lockdown been for you so far pete we're recording this i can see from uh, from your home so i imagine there's been a lot more home working going on yeah and you can see from my hair that i haven't had a proper haircut for weeks uh-huh. now um it's, I mean, it's been a roller coaster. I think there's been some moments of real encouragement, you know, recognizing that there is a spiritual hunger that we're experiencing in London, but across this nation that's unique, remarkable. And we're seeing people sort of like visit church and engage in church in different sort of, you know, contexts. And that's been amazing. And then the other side has been incredibly challenging. I think leading a church where there's so much change. I think, you know, change management is emotionally draining. And when week by week you're trying to actually transition staff teams to, just to adapt to what we're facing, that, that's been challenging at times. And yet recognising that it feels something extraordinary is happening all around us, that God is at work. And I think we can see some of that. And I'm sure it's going to take years, maybe decades, before we fully understand like, where God was at work in this season. But I feel deeply hopeful that God's at work in, in amazing ways. And that, yeah. I, I feel like you know, the job of a church leader, in one sense, I imagine everything's changed. In another sense, I suppose yeah. not much has at all, because obviously your day-to-day working practices have completely shifted and yeah. you know, office space and managing people working from home, all that's changed. But in another sense, the, the day-to-day more social yeah. action pastoral stuff is, is probably just the same as ever, if not even more intense, perhaps, as you're dealing with people who have got sick or have lost loved ones. Yeah, exactly. So, so much has changed but it's it's still essentially the same you know bits of ministry that we're involved in so i guess three big areas for us one is like gathering so everything went online um so that that was the first big shift of like, oh my goodness okay what does it look like to live stream to de- develop content you know worship prayer ministry teaching the second area is spiritual formation so we have hubs they're like small groups groups of like 10 to 15 how do we you know create virtual hubs that meet virtually but sort of serve locally so that was a big shift trying to get as many people into these hub communities recognizing that isolation and loneliness would be a real challenge of the season so that was a a second big shift and then we have other groups pattern groups that are kind of more intentional discipleship so spiritual formation has been a big area and then mission how do we serve the local area so food bank we're very, very involved in prison ministry at Pentonville Prison nearby, other compassion ministries, and they've all had to adapt. So in many ways, it's the same kind of ministry, but they're functioning in such a different way and need maybe a different leadership style to serve the season. So that's been the challenge. And, and at the same time, that's been the beauty of seeing that actually church can adapt, that historically the church has always been able to adapt in a crisis. So whilst we can't meet in our buildings, the church is alive and well. A lot of churches, actually including my own, have been reporting um, huge increases in the number of people attending. So to give you an example, my church, we'd, across both of our sites, we'd have maybe 200 adults on a Sunday. Whereas if you look at the YouTube numbers now of live streaming, we're having 500, 600 views a week. Incredible. And when you think that one yeah. view could account for three or four people around a television, you just think exactly. this, is, this is crazy. Have you been seeing similar things? Yeah, we've absolutely been seeing that. I, I think those that have been part of KXC over the years and then moved you know, abroad or elsewhere in the UK, but feel a deep sense of connection. I'm guessing some of those are tuning in, but I think probably the big area of growth is those that have been intrigued, curious, you know, there's a spiritual hunger. Now it's never been easier just to walk into the back of a church. You know, you don't need to wear anything to disguise yourself. You can literally log on and there you are. And if the stats are right, that, within the 18 to sort of 35 demographic, 34% of the population have popped into an online service. I mean, that is remarkable. Um, So I think we're probably seeing a lot of people 
just pinging a message to their friend, hey, why don't you try church? And then just them dropping in. At the same time as saying all that, of course, we, uh, this hasn't yet translated, as far as I can tell, into massive new numbers of people coming to faith. Yeah. Um, so, you know, some people have said, oh, these, these are hopeful signs. But is, yeah. is it just too early to make broader judgments? Or, or are we getting a bit carried away with our viewing figures when, you know, bear in mind, one view, that could be someone logging on for 10 seconds and then going somewhere else, presumably. Or, or my mum watching the service 10 times, <laughs> which isn't really possible. I mean, I think what's incredibly exciting is the spiritual hunger. I think you're right. It's too soon to tell, you know, what, how that will translate in the coming months, you know, years. But I think recognising that, that something's happening and people are asking questions. Like I think the UK blessing, you know, was a great example of a secular nation that one of the foundational beliefs is that, you know, you don't need to live under the blessing of God to live a full life are suddenly being mesmerized and fascinated by this blessing being sung over them. Now that's, that's incredible. I think that probably is a sign that there's a curiosity and a spiritual hunger, and whether it's kind of sales of Bibles, people logging into sort of like apps to find out how to pray. I think they're all suggesting the same thing, that there's a secular narrative that's being questioned and there's a spiritual hunger that has been activated and I think this is the opportunity for the church to recognize that whenever we preach, whenever we call people to worship, we're not just calling the 200 or whatever the normal gathering is. We're actually calling a lot of people that haven't experienced this before into an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's the bit that we should be really excited by. I think we should see it as an opportunity and an invitation. Um, and that if we really do turn ourselves outwards, that yeah we could see that when we regather gosh there's so many present that weren't present before lockdown the other big story of the day in fact it is the story arguably that's that's even eclipsing lockdown right now is the story of racial justice what yeah. began in america with the terrible shooting of george floyd we've all seen the the terrible pictures and the video from that has now turned into well i guess it's added fuel to the fire really of the black lives matter movement for sure and we're seeing demonstrations where you are in the middle of london yeah. and we're seeing also a lot of church leaders making statements um and even going as far to repent and to apologize for previously bad attitudes so tell me a bit about that journey and where you've slotted into what's going on now and particularly what your response has been to, to what we're seeing in London and around the world yeah I mean uh, first part of, of the COVID-19 crisis we were basically saying to our church community this is an imposed desert experience you know if you look at the scriptures the purpose of the desert is it's, it's a stripping back it's a purification in fact one of the interesting things I discovered in lockdown is that the word quarantine and um, the root word is a Venetian word, quarantina. It literally means 40 days. So in the 14th, 15th century, during the, the plague, the Black Death, when ships came into harbour, they'd have to wait 40 days before any passengers could come on board. So suddenly I got very excited about preaching Luke 4, you know, Jesus entering into the wilderness for 40 days, that essentially it was a quarantine. It was a, a process of, of stripping back. And what you're left with is the voice of the Father that communicates his heart over us. And I felt like for a lot of us, our experience of the early stage of quarantine was things were being stripped back. Idols were being exposed, attachments, addictions. We all became aware of the stuff that we'd been busy trying to push down. All of it was coming to the surface. It was deeply uncomfortable as a leader. There were moments I was like, oh my gosh, you know, there's so much stirring. This is, this is horrific. But recognizing even that is the grace and the mercy of God saying, okay, now, now let me in, let me into this stuff, because this could be a moment of phenomenal spiritual formation where you grasp my love at the very deepest level. Now, I think then what's happened is what was happening personally, I think it's beginning to happen culturally, that the deep ills of society have now come to the surface. And in the horrific murder of George Floyd, that the evil of racism has been exposed and people haven't been distracted because there's been many many other you know similar events that have taken place but for whatever reason this one has triggered this outrage this rise in, in sort of anger and i wonder if it is the grace of god saying look this is an evil that's embedded into society and 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 it's time for change so i think what we've been trying to say to our congregation is is this is an invitation how we respond to this moment is of critical importance that we absolutely do need to repent you know, I think there's three stages of repentance that we've been trying to go through, um, recognizing the wrong and recognizing the role the church has played 
and at a very local level at KXC, the role that my wife and I have played, you know, just trying to name some of the unconscious bias and white privilege and just recognizing this isn't evil and it's not out there. It's not in the States, it's here, but it's not just out there in the church. It's present in our own community, recognizing it, repenting, getting on our knees, humbling ourselves and, and turning towards Jesus and then re replacing, you know, these distorted mindsets with the mindsets and the ways of the kingdom. So we're trying to lead our church through that process. And right now, I think the priority is, is listening and learning. So trying to listen to stories where people have experienced pain, trying to actually do as much learning, um, reading around this, recognizing there's whole parts of our history that were very much glossed over in our education. And it's actually our responsibility for our brothers and sisters of color to say, look, no, we want to learn history so that we can understand you know, the journey that you've experienced so that we can be part of the remedy. We've been part of the problem and we want to repent, but we want to be part of God's kingdom, kingdom plan to bring restoration. So that's the kind of journey we're on as a family. In so Christ. is there anything that you've personally learned even in the past couple of weeks that's been new to you about your own personal behavior or actions that you're, you're seeking to change? Yeah. So we, we, we developed a team about two years ago trying to address this stuff because our, our congregation has been massively growing in terms of diversity and and we we had an amazing group of people that came to us with such grace and humility and said look there's some serious blind spots that we would lovingly you know want to highlight so we began to meet with them and over the course of a two-year journey they've kind of been addressing things in our own sort of team around leadership development how how do we identify leaders how do we raise leaders up? You know, what does it look like to embrace different cultures? You know, a lot of people have been talking about the distinction between being multiracial and multicultural. That actually, what does it look like in terms of worship and teaching styles? So we were on that journey. So at one level, I felt like the spirit had prepared us and given us some tools for what we're now experiencing. Um, and at the same time, I guess the deep disappointment in the last few weeks for me has been, gosh, there's so much more we need to do. And that actually I haven't taken my role nearly seriously enough in terms of the kind of change, systemic change that is going to be needed for us to be, you know, a more beautiful expression of God's kingdom. So I think we were on that journey, but recognizing now this is a pivot point. We need to receive it as a, an invitation of God to actually bring about, you know, significant cultural change in our community. I noticed you went to uh, one of the Black Lives Matter protests in London. Yeah. It, it, did you, was that a difficult decision to make? The reason I asked that is just because some would say, isn't there a slight contradiction between you as a church leader saying we need to follow government advice on social yeah. distancing and we need to take yeah. this seriously. And at the same time, going to a protest, which was, as far as, far as I understand, it was technically illegal. So how did you come yeah. to that decision? Yeah. And it, and it was a tricky one. And, and essentially what I wanted to do was, is to, you know, add my voice to essentially saying, to, to, to say, yeah, things have to change, that there has to be, you know, a peaceful protest saying that we're not willing just to tolerate how things have been. Um, and I kind of felt for me personally, that felt more important to me to say, look, I want to make a stand um, for what I believe is right and, and the road ahead. So that that's the decision I made. And I think, you know, for every pastor, they had to sort of hold that prayerfully of like, what is my response? And one aspect of my response was being present um, at, at a protest to just to say, look, I, I believe in this and I'm willing to make personal sacrifices um, for the change that I long to see. And I suppose as well, the, the other thing I've noticed from Christians on specifically on Black Lives Matter is, is some, some Christians have sort of looked into the, the background of the movement, even gone on the website and, and noticed yeah. things even on the official website, which, which many Christians would take issue with. For example, there's a line saying we want to disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. And there's some things about we want to free ourselves from heteronormative thinking, which, you know, plenty of Christians, they wouldn't go along with that. But I suppose there's an understanding from your point of view that you're not necessarily endorsing everything about the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, but you're mere, more on board with the, the main point. Did that factor exactly. into the decision as well? I think exactly that. And I think one of the responses um, that's going to be key in the, in the weeks and months ahead is, is, is for us to recognise what is the role of the church here. Um, that there's probably a secular narrative at play 
and actually we have a story that is different to the secular narrative and the roadmap for us you know is, is going to be different and we need to to name that so i i'm sure a lot of us have been preaching revelation 7 you know every tribe and tongue gathered around the lamb that was slain you've got a picture of diversity like beautiful expression of kingdom diversity there I think a lot of the secular narrative is, is trying to take some of the framework of the Judeo-Christian worldview, a linear view of time, for example, you know, an idea of sort of like progress towards something. And you, you develop a secular vision that wants Revelation 7 just without the lamb that was slain. They want every tribe and tongue gathered, but they just want to get rid, rid of Jesus. They want the kingdom. They don't want the king. And I think the church has to be really intentional in our communication right now that we believe the gospel is the message that can bring about this kind of unity that diversity you know is going to be expressed when there's unity around something and for us mm -hmm. as followers of jesus that's gathered around the lamb that was slain and if we don't make that message we could be swept along with other agendas secular agendas and other um and miss proclaiming our story which at, at its end is this vision that we read in revelation 7. it's tricky isn't it with um with language like you say when you've got christians and secular people using the same words such as justice or yes. even the one i think about quite a lot is is god loves you you know there's an understanding of god loves you that's the kind of you know fluffy pink valentines god loves yeah. you there's also yeah. an understanding of god loves you that's very different to that which is god loves yeah. you enough to die for you and to yeah. so so we're using the same words but we often don't quite mean the same things yeah and, and therefore i think this is a moment where as we've mentioned before incredible spiritual hunger and curiosity and potentially for some a questioning of the secular narrative is it bringing about what we wanted to see in society um and i think this is an incredible opportunity for us to proclaim our story you know some part of the book in fact the kind of central purpose of the book is the story you live in is the story you live out if we're not proclaiming our story right now then goodness me we're never going to be because there is a, there's an opening where people are hungry for a story that brings about this kind of vision of justice and you know humanity flourishing and we believe we have the story that that is the hope for all of creation and we have to proclaim it now and and we have to recognize our story will come into tensions with the secular narrative like they are not the same and that's what i get concerned about where i see some people thinking no this is the same you're like well that there, there might be overlap in certain areas but it's, they're not the same stories they are not sure. the same stories so um, it's probably about time here on the profile that we actually talked about you, Pete. So tell me a bit about <laughs> tell me a bit about your story. I understand you grew up in a in a Christian background, but tell me about how faith became real and the the journey you went on as a as a child and as a teenager and what God meant to you at that stage. Yeah, so I I grew up in a Christian family. My dad was a vicar. Um, first in High Wycombe, so that's where first 11 years of my life was spent in, in Wycombe, and then we moved to Birmingham. He became the vicar of St John's Harborn. Um, so, you know, the secondary school years were, were in, in Birmingham. I managed to avoid the accent. So often people don't realise <laughs> I am a Brummie, but I am indeed a Brummie. Um, and sort of, yeah, so being around church a lot, probably at that time it was like, okay, love what my dad does, but like, I'm never going down that path. Um, so I ended up actually studying maths and philosophy at university um, and didn't really know where that was going to take me. I just didn't think it would ever take me into ministry. And I'd been quite involved in Soul Survivor. Um, and at the end of university, Mike Pilavachi offered me a job working with him at Soul Survivor. And I think that was probably the first step into ministry. Um, and it just kind of, yeah, felt like the law was sort of like opening some doors. So I, I walked through them and suddenly like, I came alive. And I feel like that was when this kind of deep sense of like, this is more than just something that's enjoyable. This is tapping into a deep sense of what I'm about, maybe my contribution in life. Um, so that's when sort of, yeah, began to pursue that. Ended up being on staff there for a few years. Church planting was beginning to stir. Um, so ended up moving in central London to study theology um, and be on the leadership team of St. Mary's Barnton Square Church in central London. Eventually got ordained and, and then planted KXC. So from having sort of grown up and sort of like, yeah, I guess I inherited my faith. And then around the age of 11 is when I felt like there was a moment actually at a new wine festival summer camp where I encountered the spirit and realized, OK, I didn't want to just inherit a faith. I wanted this to be my faith that I run with my personal walk with Jesus. And then that journey 
from you know school through to university through to Saw Survivor through to moving into London studying yeah I just feel like God's kind of like led me on this path to where we are now leading this church in King's Cross so tell me a bit about the church and, and how it's grown um, because I, I noticed there's been quite a lot of media attention I know the BBC and others have turned up and filmed and said wow look at this there's a growing thriving church in the middle of London yeah. who knew kind of thing no and that, that was a funny thing people were getting in contact it was like apparently there's a church that isn't dying <laughs> in London in this secular city um, yeah so we planted 10 years ago we planted into King's Cross and as many will know historically King's Cross known as quite a deprived part of London it's basically known for the train station. You kind of pass through King's Cross. You don't get off the train and just sort of like hang around there. But in the last decade, it's experienced phenomenal regeneration. So when people move to, to King's Cross from now and join the church, I always try and tell them the backstory because they see, you know, Central St. Martin's University and all the restaurants and the Google premises being built. It's just this incredible, you know, center of culture. But, you know, Decade plus, it was known as the red light district, serious issues of gang crime, you know, high deprivation and, and poverty. And, and we basically went to Bishop of London, sort of 2008, 2009, said, look, there's this huge redevelopment being planned. What if we planted a church now to be part of the unfolding story, rather than waiting 10 years and then saying, why don't we try and get involved? What if we're here from the beginning? Um, and then as the redevelopment takes place, we can be investing into the spiritual regeneration of King's Cross. So we're 10 years into the story. We celebrated our 10 year birthday, literally just before going into lockdown. And it's been a roller coaster journey. Um, as with all church planning stories, there's been highs and there's been lows. And I think we're constantly surprised by what God has done and is doing. When you gather like 12 friends to say, you know, what if we do something? And you meet with the bishop and the bishop says, brilliant, let's go for it. You really don't know what lies ahead. I mean, you have hopes and you have dreams. But then there's moments when God steps in and ministries are birthed and people come to faith. And you like, wow, this is such a joy to be part of this. So 10 years on, yeah, I look back with just deep gratitude in my heart that, that we've been part of this story. I'm always conscious when asking church leaders this question, I need to preface it with, we know numbers aren't everything, but even so, <laughs> but even so just, just give us a little bit of a ballpark figure. Started with 12. Yeah. Where are you at now? Yeah. So we, we had a core team of 12 and we first Sunday, we had kind of 40 that gathered and that was a lot of people from St. Mary's where we were planted out of. And then now, you know, sort of in terms of Sunday attendance, you know, there's all sorts of different stats. Especially now with online, many... I suppose. There's all sorts yeah, exactly. of different ways online, of the whole, <laughs> new ball game. I think the online thing is your times by 10, right? <laughs> that's what we've been doing. Um, but it, before lockdown, you know, how many come, you know, each, each week? So I think it's, you know, I've heard people say one and three in terms of attendance. But anyway, in terms of actual Sunday attendance, we were sort of like averaging around 700 across three congregations. Um, and it's, yeah, it, that's been really encouraging to see people come to faith, come back to faith and come alive in their faith. And, you know, I want to be honest in the stats, you know, we would love, we would have loved to see far more come to faith for the first time. We've seen quite a lot of that, but I would be lying if I said that's been the main form of our growth. We've seen a lot of people that, you know, were disillusioned with church, they've given up on church, actually experience community and have a journey of coming back to faith. We've seen quite a lot of that. And we've seen a lot of people move to the city because there's this constant coming and going, finding home in church. And I think finding home in London, let alone finding home in church can be a challenge. Yeah. So we've seen a lot of growth through that. Um, and it's been, yeah, yeah, it's been a beautiful thing. Let's, uh, let's talk a bit about that second category, because I think that's really interesting. Those who were disillusioned, yeah. walked away from faith or church, or for whatever reason, finding a home. Because I, I think that's really fascinating, kind of how and why people find their way back. And, you know, yeah. sadly, we know there's, there's a lot of hurt people out there who've had bad experiences of, of the church before. Um, and without asking you to blow your own trumpet too much, I'm sure there are things you've done as a church and as a community to make sure you are a welcoming place or things you've been deliberate yeah. and intentional about to say, well, if we want to welcome people in who used to be part of church, but now have all sorts of hangups about it, we need to tread carefully in these areas. So I'd love to hear a bit about that, because I think that's quite relevant for a lot of leaders who, like you, would be honest and say, yeah, since we started a church, if I'm honest, the main growth hasn't been people who were atheists and now Christians. But, yeah. you know, we know God cares about everyone, including those who have walked away yeah. from church who now need to kind of find a way back in. So I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, I think we had a value statement that we began using from day one, 
which is that we want to be a church that was safe enough for people to heal and dangerous enough for people to grow. And I think it probably actually tapped into a deep longing of particularly a millennial crowd back then of wanting authenticity and adventure. You know, I, I think, and I, again, I think the culture shifted a lot in 10 years. So I'm really talking sort of like 10 years ago, what we were beginning to speak into. But there were a lot of people that basically didn't know how to process pain. Um, and they didn't associate church with the kind of place you would take your pain. You might dress up for church or you might put on a brave face. You know, you would bring your A game to church, um, but you wouldn't walk in the door and, and acknowledge that you were battling an alcohol addiction, um, that you were addicted to your work, that you were, you know, struggling with eating habits. It, church just wasn't associated with the place where you'd process pain. So I think actually what happened for a lot of people, particularly a millennial kind of demographic, is they found other forms of self-medicating, which has led to like the crazy levels of addictions that we see, you know, ac across our nation and across society. And I think we basically said, no, we wanted to create a spiritual home where you could walk in the door and experience love and love for who you are, not who you'd like to be. So I think this is what happens for a lot of younger folk is they project a certain person, they experience love for being that certain person, and then that creates this gap of like, I know that I'm not actually that person, but they love that person. So I've got to keep performing to be that person because if they find out that I'm not that, you know, I'm going to experience rejection. So we said that we just want to break that and we want to say, bring your true self. And if you've had a horrific day, if you're battling doubt or addictions or whatever else, you are welcome. And if you bring your true self, um, warts and all, and experience love, then we're talking about transformation. Um, if you bring your false self and experience love, that isn't transformation. So we spoke very much into that. And I think a lot of people began to actually, you know, articulate and express their pain. I think Richard Raw, who I know is a controversial writer for, for many people. So let me just name that before I quote him. But he has this fascinating um, statement on spirituality. He says a lot of spirituality is essentially how we process pain. He says you've got two options. You transmit it or you transform um, and I think that's fascinating that essentially if you bring it to God, um, the one who transforms and redeems our pain, then you are going to experience transformation. The refusal to do that means you will just transmit your pain on your nearest and dearest and whatever else. So we were trying to invite people into the transformation journey. So I think that really accessed, you know, something within people. And then we, we called them towards adventure. We basically said, look, you know, we want to send you outside your comfort zones into God's mission field where you're going to have to become reliant on the spirit and you're going to have to live by faith. Um, and I think people grow most when they're outside comfort zones. And again, for a lot of people, their church experience has been, don't bring a true self, um, but you, you're essentially in the pew, listen, do X, Y, Z, lead a small group, but it hasn't been calling them to adventure. And I think people were longing to experience an adventure so i think that was some of the stuff that we began to speak into i guess one th you know final thing then is the area of discipleship we realized a lot of people were coming their understanding of discipleship was basically a quiet time um and a sunday gathering no one was talking to them about what it meant to follow the way of jesus as a banker as someone in the fashion industry as someone in education no one was saying actually the story of God means that you need to view your sphere of industry and where you live and your community entirely differently. Like that is your, you know, spiritual formation ground. And we need to think about, you know, what do those parts of your day look like when it comes to your faith? And for a lot of people, they're like, oh, no one's really ever affirmed my job as a teacher. I just thought that was secondary. Um, and I think some of those things actually really began to scratch where there was a deep itch. When thinking more generally about culture and the UK, it's often said that, that future culture is generated in the big cities, capital cities like London. Yeah. The culture starts there and it spreads out to the rest of the world. And obviously, same thing with younger people. Younger people yeah. sort of set, are setting the trend now for what might be the reality in the rest of the country in 20, 30 yeah. years time. So with that in mind, do you, I mean, does it feel like that when you're doing, when you're doing KXC? Does it feel like we are encountering problems here yeah. that people in some village up in the northeast... Yeah. I'm not encountering, but they may do in 20 or 30 years time. And we're seeing it now. And do you feel that sense of, I don't want to put it too, I don't want to make it sound too grand, but almost a certain sense of responsibility of passing on what you're learning as a, as a church yeah. leader in the middle of London and being aware that, that the sorts of things you're facing could face, um, could influence other churches in 20 or 30 years down the line. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is yes and no. Let me do the no one because that's quite easy. I think when you do begin to think too much like that, something like Brexit happens and you realize <laughs> yeah. you, were, you were in this bubble of like a younger demographic in an urban context and you thought, oh, you, you knew exactly how things were heading. And then you realize, gosh, we're out of touch. And there's an arrogance mm. to a context like London that you can be blind to. So I think the no part, I think we've been humbled by some of what's happened in the last few years of like, you can't afford to be out of touch with what's happening actually across the nation. And at the same time, I think we've had to reimagine what ministry looks like in a central London church. In that, I think they say the sort of turnover is like every three years. So essentially every three years, your congregation almost completely renews itself, which is, is crazy. Um, and it's actually painful. You feel like you're constantly saying goodbyes because people are, you know, having kids and moving out or they get a job elsewhere. Um, but I think the reframing is, okay, so we have people for maybe a three year you know, time and we're trying to encourage people to put down roots um, in the city for the long haul. But even so, there's a lot of people who are coming and going and you realize, okay, well, what can we give them over three years? Maybe this isn't the best language to use right now with COVID-19, but we were using it previously. How can we infect people <laughs> with the values of the kingdom of God with a vision of spiritual formation that can counter the formation they're experiencing in their workplaces. So when they go to be part of another church and they move to different parts of the city, different parts of the world, they're actually taking kingdom culture with them, which is a certain view of, you know, yeah, God's engagement in society, a certain desire to engage in, in ministries of compassion, a culture of generous giving, you know, and the list could go on. So I think we have recognized that, People are constantly coming into London, but they're constantly going out. And if you can ha have that mindset of spreading something, um, then you recognize, yeah, people from KXC end up all over the place. And we, wanna, we want them to take something that's really valuable. I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier about people um, having this kingdom mindset of actually my, my nine to five, my job in the city yeah. or my job as a teacher or my job as a dustman, whatever it is, matters to God and having that kingdom perspective. Because I think that brings us to the book, All Things yeah. New, joining God's story of recreation is, is a big theme of that. And it's yeah. certainly been, it's been a massive trend. I think people, especially people in their twenties and thirties sort of waking up to this and thinking, actually, yeah. I might've been told a gospel that is basically Jesus died for my sins. I'm off to heaven. But, but you know, there's, there's another way of understanding this. And it's not that that's wrong. It's just, there's a whole other world out there and God wants to transform the world and, and this having this kind of kingdom mindset. So if you could speak to that a little bit, yeah. I think that'd be really helpful. I, I think Scott McKnight who's an American theologian has this phrase that the gospel belongs to the story of God. And I think a lot of people were, were given a gospel message but actually weren't immersed in the scriptures, so they didn't know the story of God. Um, so some people talk about the idea of a truncated narrative. Like if the full narrative of scripture is, is creation, fall, redemption, renewal, then essentially what began to happen in the church is people spoke less about Genesis 1 and 2, the creation story, this vision for human flourishing. Um, and they began their gospel presentations in Gen Genesis 3. Original sin. You know, it's almost like that's the beginning point. W we are all sinful and we need a saviour. So they talk about original sin, the fall, and then they talk about redemption. Everything that's been won for us through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, and essentially, there's a gospel proclaimed there that I think many of us would want to say yes and amen. And we need to proclaim that gospel. But we also need to say that the story does start in Genesis 1 and 2. And there's a vision for human flourishing. Um, that's key for us to understand and actually the very end of the story is the renewal of all things and a lot of the book is really about this you know unpacking of revelation 21 where heaven and earth you know are reconciled so that the stereotype of the christian story is we die we leave our bodies behind we ascend to a disembodied bliss where we drink red bull we ride around in harps and sing here i am to worship and I'm a big, big fan of that song, by the way. Because um, <laughs> your brother wrote it, for those who don't know. Exactly, yeah. And the royalties have contributed to birthday presents since. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I'm a big, big fan of the song. But, but the story isn't actually anything to do with the New Testament. Like, the end of the story isn't us ascending to a disembodied bliss. God actually comes down and makes his dwelling place with humanity here on earth. Um, and then the apostle, you know, John, who's writing this vision down, says, look, you know, there was no death, no grief, no crying, no pain. Former things, all of the, you know, sinful, you know, parts of the story, all of that's renewed. And then you've got this big statement. God sits down and says, behold, I'm making all things new. 
and in the Greek language that the New Testament is written in, you've got two words for new. Neos, meaning brand new, and then kainos, which is something old that's made new and um, restored to its former glory. And when God sits down on his throne, he says, behold, I'm making all things. And the word is kainos that's used there. In other words, everything's being restored to how it was in the beginning. In Genesis 1 and 2, where there's no sin, no sickness, no suffering, humanity fully alive in relationship with God, fully alive in relationship with one another, and fully alive in terms of relationship with created order itself. Um, but for many people in the church, they hadn't really heard anyone teach about human flourishing based in Genesis 1 and 2. They hadn't heard the end of the narrative. They just heard this truncated story in the middle. Um, and I think if you have the truncated story, then it distorts discipleship. And it distorts actually the role that we play in society as yeast, if you like, spreading the kingdom of God. And if you recognize the end of the story is that everything gets redeemed. And if our part in the story is to be actors pushing the story towards its fulfillment when Christ returns, then actually we do need to be agents of redemption in the realms of education. We need to be redeeming politics. We need to be redeeming the fashion industry, the music industry, every sphere of culture is going to experience redemption and we're invited to be agents of redemption. So it re reframes every part of our discipleship. Um, and I think that message, a lot of people, myself included, didn't necessarily grow up with this full understanding of the story. And I think it's indicative of a generation that haven't been shaped by scripture, didn't grow up, you know, reading their Bibles every day. So they could hear a talk, you know, but they didn't know how to place that within the overarching narrative of scripture. And I guess that was the task for my wife and I when we planted KXE. We knew that it would be a young demographic because the area is so young demographically. London is so young in many ways demographically. We're like, okay, we need to reacquaint re that generation with the story that they belong to because it's a far greater story than they currently realise. Yeah, and, you know, as you say, millennials, perhaps even millennials growing up in church didn't, weren't necessarily reading their Bibles a huge amount. I imagine the next generation down, Generation Z, it's probably even harder, isn't it? Because, I mean, some well, people said it's, it's, it's harder in the sense that they're even more biblically illiterate, but other people said it's easier because at least they don't have any preconceived yeah. ideas at all. Well, and that's, that's the shift. Isn't it incredible over 10 years, the shift that we've seen in culture? Like when we began, you know, I was, I was quoting Richard Dawkins. I was trying to push back against those that were sort of like very suspicious of organized religion. And I felt like in a lot of the conversations with agnostics or atheists, you know, I was trying to engage in that debate. Um, and maybe that speaks into what we referenced earlier. A lot of people had a bad experience of church. Um, and that bad experience, they found a voice articulating that and then building on top of it in a Richard Dawkins or Harris or whoever else. What, what we're seeing now with Gen Z is they've got no experience of church, which means it's a blank slate. So they're not coming in as like, oh, I hate organized religion. I hate church. They're coming with like, whoa, I've never seen anything like this before. So there is like high levels of curiosity. There's genuine openness and there's longing for experience. You know, they don't need to understand it all. You know, they're like, I'm happy to open myself to an encounter with Jesus um, and I'll, I'll try and figure out as we go. So I, I think you're right that biblical literacy is a massive issue, but there's a greater spiritual hunger and openness than, than was present 10 years ago. Um, and we've seen even before, I think this is a year, two years ago, the Talking Jesus report. You know, it was just trying, it was giving some statistics around how much openness there is right now to the gospel and any church pastor evangelist basically thinking that they were coming up against the kind of new atheists and people were cynical and angry. You're like, no, 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 that's 10 years out of date. That's not the crowd we're preaching to now. They're curious, they're open and, and they, they, they want to hear what we have to say. Um, towards the end of the book, you start talking about the the end of all things i suppose i mean all yeah. things new but it's also well yeah. there is going to come a point where you and i leave this planet what what happens yeah. next again probably an issue that i think a lot of christians are a bit a bit fuzzy on if they're honest um yeah. so so tell me a bit about you know when when christians use language like you know i'm going to be with god i'm going to go to heaven i'm going to go to heaven when i die sort of where yeah. you sit because i know people like tom wright have kind of critiqued that and said well no god's going to renew the whole earth we're going to come back to yeah. planet earth and we're not going to be on a cloud singing here I am to worship as you put it earlier um so if it's so if it's not that then what exactly is it yeah. and, and has our language been so wrong when people have said oh I'm going to heaven when I die is that is that yeah. really bad theology no it doesn't that's bad theology I, 
I think, so Tom Wright has language, he talks about life after life after death. That just to really confuse after, people. Just to really, yeah, just to really mess with people's minds. Um, and I think he's essentially saying sort of paradise is a language that, you know, people may be quite familiar with, of a sense being with Jesus, of, you know, this is for those that have departed before Christ's return. So paradise is, is, is where, you know, those that yeah, depart, they are in the presence of Jesus um, before Christ's return, which is the point where essentially the very ending of Revelation 21, 22 of heaven and earth being reconciled, God and humanity being reconciled, everything being restored to how it was intended to be. So I, I think, you know, I actually wrote some of those chapters when my father-in-law had passed away. And I was asking all of those questions of like, you know, not just from a theological point of view, but like, actually, what, what's going on? And it was this sense of like, my father-in-law, Nick, who's just an amazing man of God, just deep peace. I know that Nick's with Jesus. He's with Jesus and experiencing like perfect peace in the presence of God. And there will be a moment where Christ returns and Nick will be with him where we will experience this created order around us, but with no sin, sickness, suffering. Um, and that's something that is just, it's so exciting to say, well, what would it look like? This order that we experience, but without racism and without any form of, of physical, sexual, any form of abuse, without any sin and greed and no poverty, what would it look like? And you're like, that's beautiful. Like, as you begin to imagine it. And then when you realize, you know, that God can do more than we could possibly ever ask for or imagine. You think, wow, that, that, you know, heaven, future heaven, that's something to really look forward to. And at the same time, Christians will get excited about that. And yet at the back of our minds, we'll think, but what about so-and-so family member, friend who doesn't call yes. himself a Christian, yeah. um, doesn't follow Jesus? What happens to them? And of course, your answer to this is one that surprised me. Um, yeah. you, don't, you don't land on the, let, let's say, the traditional evangelical understanding of hell. Um, you take a, a different view. So just tell me a little bit about how you, how you came to that place and, and what your understanding is of hell. Yeah, so I, I'd read a number of books, but one that was super helpful, Skeletons in God's Closet, um, an American author, um, I've forgotten his name right now. He's Joshua Ryan Butler. Is yes, it? there you go. Um, who just had this super helpful framework of essentially the, the traditional story that a lot of us probably inherited was like you've got life here and then you've got two options like two arrows of one you know heaven and the other one hell um and he then basically went through actually you know scriptural texts recognizing that heaven and hell aren't actually ever used as counterparts in the same verse in scripture so the counterpart to heaven is earth so the beginning of the story is god created the heavens and the earth you know, the end of the story is God reconciling heaven and earth. The whole of the story is about the restoration of heaven and earth and the sin that's separated are actually being dealt with in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. But in the story that a lot of us grew up with, we thought the counterpart to heaven was, was hell. So if actually the story is about what God wants to do in bringing together heaven and earth, then, you know, what's hell? And, and essentially, in this book that I'd read and I found it super helpful, he was essentially saying that the Revelation 21, 22 picture is heaven coming down to earth. And actually, in that reconciliation, hell, which is everything that stands in opposition to God's purposes, that which cannot coexist with God's perfect ways, will be flushed from the earth. Um, so essentially, rather than it being this kind of, you've got a decision here or here, it's actually, no, God is going to come down, make his dwelling place with humanity, and as heaven and earth become one, hell will be flushed from God's created order. Which then there's lots of like metaphors around Gehenna, this word that's used in the New Testament, which was the dumping ground outside the city walls of Jerusalem, and had a little trip to Jerusalem a year or so ago, and visited this valley site called Gehenna. Lots of that language is from the Old Testament. So I then just sort of tried to do some of the kind of groundwork to provide a case for sort of essentially the annihilationist position of, of hell, that, that essentially hell is the removal of anything that cannot exist in the presence of God. And when God returns, yeah, all of that will be flushed away. So basically the idea, because the tradition, I mean, the traditional position, I think on an emotional level is quite hard to stomach. I think even for those yeah. who do hold it, you know, because the traditional perspective 
which Catholic Church, many evangelicals would hold, is that if you die without Christ, you will suffer forever in eternal conscious yes. torment, which is not a nice thing to have to think about. Yes. But what you're saying with an annihilation perspective is actually no, there may be some suffering in hell, but there will be an end to it. Um, yes which is, I think is one of the reasons why that, that position is sometimes called conditional immortality. So basically, yeah. God does not supernaturally keep you alive in hell in order to punish you, but there yes. will be an end to your suffering in hell and you will just cease to exist. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think, you know, John Stott and other evangelicals have put forward the annihilationist position for, you know, for some time. So it might not have been the dominant you know, stream, but it's very much been present sure. within, the, within the evangelical family. And, and for me, so I hadn't really studied this, even, even at theological college, I probably shouldn't say that, but there wasn't really any teaching on this. So suddenly I was like, okay, I, I, I was writing this book and I knew what I wanted to say about heaven. And I was like, I don't even know what to say about hell. And it's like, but it, surely anyone who's going to really sort of grapple with the story and how this story ends, you know, and I quote, I think Thomas Merton regularly in the book, you know, our lives are shaped by the end we live for. I was like, if I'm going to talk about the end of the story and how we are actually pushing the story towards its climactic moment where Christ returns, I, I've kind of got to talk about hell. So then began some of these studies and, and actually found my own more traditional um, sort of you know, upbringing. I was like, hang on, I'm not sure I fully agree with that now that I'm engaging in some of the texts. And, and so I went on a journey and I thought I'd do the dangerous thing, the risky thing of actually putting that journey in the book. Um, you know, because it would have been a far safer option just to leave that chapter out. And then I was like, do you know what? I actually think how we talk about hell matters. Yeah. Because if you don't talk about hell, you can end up with universalists basically, you know, pushing forward a case. But I, I don't think the options are universalism or the very standard, sure. you know, um, eternal conscious torment. I actually think there's something that isn't universalism, which is totally orthodox. I think it's present in scripture. Um, which is what I've tried to articulate. Absolutely. And I have to say, as someone who enjoys reading, uh, I was going to say a, a theology book. It, it is a book contained with theology, but I wouldn't want that to put off people who don't see themselves as, as academically minded, let's say, because it's very, very accessible, but nevertheless, there's plenty of theology in it. But as someone who enjoys reading books like that, I've got to be honest, I get a bit bored if, if the author just agrees with all of my conclusions. So, <laughs> you know, I'm really pleased you left the chapter in for what it's worth. Um, and it's interesting on that particular topic. I'm on a bit of a journey myself and looking at the various options. But this isn't about me. This is about you, Pete. Uh, final yeah. question. Um, tell me a bit about what your hopes are for the next couple of months. I'm asking specifically, of course, about what on earth reopening church looks like. Now, I appreciate yeah. we're still at the stage. You may not be able to answer that fully. But nevertheless, people will want to know, when can I go back to KXC in yeah. physical form? And what are the sorts of things you're having to think through? Because as far as I can tell, the government are suggesting that as soon as July, you could perhaps, in theory, open your doors yeah. for some sort of meeting. So we're not thinking that. I think we're, we're aware that, I mean, we don't own a church building. So that's, that's point one. I mean, that would sure. be a lovely problem to have. Um, but those that do own church buildings, there's definitely going to be an opening. Um, and, and that's, you know, on our doorstep of, for prayer. For people coming in, you know, for private prayer, that's absolutely, you know, step one next step will be smaller gatherings um i think for us you know because we are you know slightly larger church it, it's hard to actually see this happening anytime soon so we're trying to sort of recognize okay so the the online gatherings that's probably around for a while but what are the smaller gatherings that could actually be open to us in, in the coming sort of weeks and months um and that, that's probably what we're trying to get our head around. And actually, I mean, oh gosh, I miss that just gathering together, corporate worship. Oh, I miss it so much. Preaching to a camera for me, I, I can't stand it. It sucks. Um, the, you know, communion, being together, I just love it. And I know everyone's talking about all, all these opportunities of online church. And I agree, there's incredible spiritual opportunities. Maybe we're not talking enough about, like, just what we can't do and, and the sort of pain of that. Um, but I think in terms of the stuff that we can do, I'd rather be cautious to sort of like protect like safety and well-being when it comes to a congregation. I'd rather take risks when it comes to mission. So things like our food bank and those that are, are in genuine, you know, moments and maybe it's way more than moments, but of vulnerability deprivation. I think we should lay aside personal well-being to serve those that need have, have greatest need. 
So I think in terms of outreach and mission, it's like that's where I think the church historically has always been countercultural in terms of like we're going to make sacrifices for the kingdom. But the kind of sacrifices which are just about like, oh, it would be so much nicer for us to gather and dot, dot, dot. I, I'm willing to actually live with a bit more pain there because we are reaching more people than we've ever reached before, you know, potentially. But I think in terms of caring for those that mental health issues are, are significant right now, food poverty, you know, isolation, other forms of poverty. That's the stuff I'm like, we need to do whatever we can possibly do. And then in terms of regathering, I'd be amazed if it's before, before September. I, I'm wondering if it's like January. I, I mean, I just don't know. We're just sure. constantly trying to keep up to speed you sure. know, with government guidelines and what others are doing. Well, Pete Hughes, I think we've covered every conceivable topic under the sun for the last hour or so. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you for having me.